Welcome to Word Pictures, a program of discussion and discovery. We examine the stories, events, and persons as described in the Word Pictures, presented in the 66 books of Scripture we know as the Word of God. But what kind of God is pictured here? By reading these stories, some become fearful, others adore. Yet others are just confused. Come, let us see for ourselves in an unrehearsed, no question barred discussion with people just like you as we search for the God of these stories. What picture of God will emerge for you? Let's join the discussion right now. Welcome to our discussion. We're so glad that you have joined us. If you were with us at our last session, you recognize the tremendous things that we were discussing about the last hours of Christ's life. We're going to continue that. And let's do, and let's start where they are walking from where they had celebrated the, the Passover, and they're walking out towards Gethsemane. And there's some conversation that is given to us in the book of John, chapter 15. So take your Bibles, turn to that reference, John 15, and let's start with verse number 11. And Jesus is speaking as they're walking along out towards Gethsemane. These things I have spoken unto you, that my joy might remain in you, and that your joy might be full. This commandment, that ye love one another as I have loved you, greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. Ye are my friends, if ye do whatsoever I command you. Henceforth I call you not servants, for the servant knoweth not what his Lord doeth. But I have called you friends, for all things that I have heard of my Father I have made known to you. Ye have not chosen me, but I have chosen you and ordained you that you should go forth and bring forth fruit, and that your fruit should remain, and that whatsoever ye shall ask in the Father's in my name, he may give it to you. These things I command you that ye love one another. Wow. What a, what a message on the way to Gethsemane. And he He's knows. not thinking about himself. No. He's not thinking about what misery he's going to go through, not complaining. No. He's thinking about his disciples. And what do you think they were thinking of? Who's going to be number one? You think after the experience in the upper room, they were still thinking like that? Or were they a little confused at this point? They're always confused. <laughs> <laughs> they, still answered the qu they still asked the question even after mm -hmm. that. Yeah. So it wasn't... What did Jesus mean with, with verse 15 there? I'm reading from my Good News Bible. I do not call you servants any longer. And, and, and let's be honest, the Greek word there is slaves. I do not call you slaves any longer because slaves do not know what their master is doing. Slaves just take orders and they do what they're told, right? Instead, I call you friends. Now, what's different about a friend? because I have told you everything I heard from my father. Horizontal relationship as opposed to a vertical relationship. And what difference does that make? Well, the, the, a slave is a, in a vertical relationship and the master tells a slave when to jump. And when did they become slaves? Who is he talking to? Is he just talking to the 12, 13, little disciples there or well, is he talking to the human race here when 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 did when did if he's talking to them when did they become slaves and if he's talking to us when did we become slaves well here in this verse he seems to imply that if you're just following orders if you're just believing what the pastor tells you without asking any questions then you're a slave what your church tells you and God bless those who are trying to lead churches. I, I you know, I, I sympathize with them. But, you know, this is a challenge. Jesus is here saying, 
if you want to be my friend instead of a slave, you need to understand what I, why I came, what I'm trying to accomplish, what I'm doing here. You need to understand why I came to die. You need a master also that wants mm. to tell you that. Yeah. <coughs> yeah, With you need. friends, you are communicating to each other. Mm -hmm. You are asking questions and giving answers both ways. Mm -hmm. And you are also serving each other. Uh, uh, really, how wonderful a slave just serves a master, but when you're friends, you're serving each other. Mm -hmm. yeah. And that's the kind of relationship Amazing. that... That uh, God wants with us. Amazing. Mm -hmm. Really amazing. Well, there's, Jesus said a number of things that were absolutely amazing on this trip from, from the upper room to Gethsemane. And the only one who really records these materials is John, and he didn't do it until 60 years later. Is it possible he got confused about what Jesus said? No, he had time to think it out. Yeah. You think, you think these ideas were ringing in his mind for the next 60, well, until the day he died? Well, uh, he experienced the, the Spirit, and these people were... Mm -hmm. You know, coming together, you know, in, in by that kind of a spirit. So mm -hmm. it, there was su su support for that idea, too, mm -hmm. for all that time. Well, let's pick a couple of other verses that he, things he said to them that were a little bit... Well, what I think is amazing is after he talks about we're friends and, and we love each other, and then he says, if the world hates you, mm -hmm. you know, it has hated me. If you're of this world, the world would not would love its own, but because you're not of the world, I chose you out of the world. And because of this, the world hates you. Mm -hmm. um, that is going on today. Yeah. Christians are often hated. And so many believers feel discouraged because they're hated when they should actually be, I don't know, maybe says, about joy, but at least knowing that Jesus said that the world would hate us. It says, a slave some. is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, put me on a cross, nailed me to a cross, they will also persecute you. Yeah. How many times do we feel we're being nailed to a cross? So. Jesus had a couple of other things that really are startling. Chapter 16, verse 7. But I am telling you the truth, it is better for you that I go away, because if I do not go, the helper... And my version has it capitalized, helper, will not come to you. But if I do go away, then I will send him to you. What's he talking about? The Holy Spirit. Talking about the Holy Spirit. The Holy That's Spirit. sure a funny way to describe it all. <laughs> <laughs> Why? I mean, the, compared to what we generally understand is Christianity. Well, it sounds like the Holy Spirit can't come until Jesus is gone. Why right. would that and why? Yeah, okay. yeah, well, yeah. The Holy Spirit has a job to cleanse us of sin, to help us become, uh, to have Jesus' robe of righteousness, or to become like Jesus, or to have his wonderful character. Jesus couldn't have done that if he were still here? For some reason, it requires Jesus to be in heaven and the Holy Spirit. That seems to be the Holy Spirit's function well, what if What if Jesus being there physically distracts him, distracts people from the, the Spirit that's supposed to go all over the world? Yeah. They're, joined, yeah. they're joined at the hip. Yeah. We've got three in one. They're the same one. We already know that Jesus is the Father. And the book of Isaiah tells us that the baby that will be born is God the Father. So mm -hmm. Old Testament, New Testament. So the only thing that's missing is the Holy Spirit. But Jesus says, unless I go, the Spirit or the Counselor cannot come. Well, but we, They're all the same. We, the Father, the Son, and the Holy it, Spirit. It's our understanding of uh, certainly the Jesus. general rule of this group is that the Holy Spirit was around in the Old Testament. From been day one. Yeah, that's right, yes. been around. The Spirit moved yes. over the face of and the it waters. Would, it would be my perception that it was around when Jesus was here, yes. yeah. doing yes. and his we work find and in the very first couple of chapters of John that that was Jesus who created the world. Yeah. So the holy, the spirit that was over the face of the waters. So what does this well, text mean? <laughs> I think the, the simplest and the clearest explanation that I've ever heard was this: 
So long as Jesus was here, the disciples that he planned to have scattered across the world, remember he said, take the gospel to every corner of the world. He said, so long as he was there, where did they want to be? Right, right next to him. They were not going to leave him more than a few feet. If he told them to go, they would go a little ways, but as quick as possible, they came back. So, so long as Jesus was here, they were not scattering. They were not carrying the gospel to the world. They were sticking right by Jesus. Why doesn't it say it that way? Why doesn't it say, because you know, if I'm here sticking around, you're never going to do what you need to do. Why doesn't it just say it nice and clear like that? Be, 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 because you know what? He said, remember what we read in John 15, 15? I want you to understand. He's, he's not saying, I'm not going to feed you a bunch of pablum here like a bunch of little kids. You need to think about this. You need to figure it out for yourself. And you need the, the authority figure removed mm -hmm. so that the, pers the young person or, or the person, individual, can l on their own time work out these, these uh, ideas that yeah. are related Plus to Plus he's them. talking about, he's talking to an audience there. That mm -hmm. audience is different than us just by virtue but of who we are. they were disciples and we're supposed to be disciples. So maybe we shouldn't be as different as we are. So how am I going to do that? How am I going to, I don't know, work at this till I, so I can get it all figured out? How do, how we, do I approach that? In, in groups just like this, we need to sit down and talk about it until, until we come up with some good ideas and we need to keep at it. We're going to be doing this for the rest of eternity, so if you're tired of it already... <laughs> <laughs> isn't, isn't there another facet here? He has, in fact, said he's finished this section of the work for yeah. him. Yeah. That he's not <laughs> leaving this alone. Right, exactly. But then he goes, just a few verses later, I have much more to tell you, but now it will be too much for you to bear. What is he talking about? Mm. You thought I wasn't coming back for at least another... 2,000 years. <laughs> wow. uh, I believe the Holy Spirit's behave almost like Jesus did when he speaks in parables. Uh, he, he uses Euistic form of teaching, give us a chance to you know, masticate yeah. what was said to us and understand it for our own selves. But I believe the Holy Spirit was always there. It is always it is with us now, but we need some sort of discernment because I've spoken with people who are pastors and have no discernment about, about certain things. Yeah. And it's, yeah. Yeah, I once had a discussion with a very intelligent woman who had a doctorate degree, and when I talked to her, she was working on a master, second master's degree and so forth. And I, get, I explained something that I thought was fairly simple from the Bible. She says, man, she says, I've been asking that question to everyone I thought I had any idea about the truth for seven years, and you're the first person who gave me a reasonable answer. Amazing. Amazing. Well, John, Jesus wasn't finished. Probably the most incredible thing of all is found in John 16, starting with verse 25. Now, before we read this, let's review a little bit. What happened if you sinned in the Old Testament? If you intentionally sinned, you were to be stoned to death. If you unintentionally sinned, then there was a whole list of sacrifices. And if you unintentionally sinned, you bought one of these sacrifices, and what happened? You managed to get separated from your sin. Okay. <laughs> so you confess your sins over the lamb, for example. You slit the lamb's throat. You see the lamb die right there in front of you. And the priest takes some of the blood, and he sprinkles it in the temple. And then later on... The, in, in, symbol, in symbol, at least, that those sins are carried from the tabernacle or from the tent far away on, on the scapegoat, never to return. So that was the idea. So you depended upon the priest and the lamb to deal with your sins, right? So is that really what's going to happen? It's, it's all these sins are transferred around and finally they're going to be dumped on Satan and he's the one that... that uh, well, I will Suffers. now read you John 16, starting with verse 25. Because it would seem, you know, in fact, even the people, in fact, we should probably read those verses. Look at Exodus 20. Now, most of us would immediately say, if I mention Exodus 20, what are you thinking of? Eight Ten commandments. commandments. <laughs> yeah, the Ten Commandments. That's verses 3 through 17, okay, in, uh, in, in, in Exodus 20. But I'm gonna, not going to read that part to you right now. I'm going to read the next couple of verses, 18 through 21. 
right immediately after the giving of the Ten Commandments. When the people heard the thunder and the trumpet blast and saw the lightning, the smoking mountain, they trembled with fear and stood a long way off. They said to Moses, notice these words, they said to Moses, if you speak to us, we will listen. But we are afraid that if God speaks to us, we will die. Moses replied, don't be afraid. God has only come to test you and make you keep on obeying him so that you will not sin. But the people continued to stand a long way off, and only Moses went near the dark cloud where God was. So what were they asking for? Intercessors. They were asking for any, Moses, you go up the mountain there. <laughs> There's some pretty bright fire up there, and that's scary as can be. You talk to God, and then you come down, and you talk to us, and we'll, we'll be comfortable. What, it turned out later, what did they say at the end of Exodus? Jesus, after spend, I mean, I'm sorry, Moses, after spending two 40-day periods with God, comes down and even Moses' face is shining so bright that what? He had to wear a veil. They were afraid even to talk to him, but to look at Moses, a human being, after that kind of experience with God. And now look what Jesus says about that experience um, and, and, and how that's going to impact us. John 16, starting with verse 25. I have used figures of speech to tell you these things. But the time will come when I will not use figures of speech, but will speak to you plainly about the Father. Now, he's back in chapter 14, Philip was saying, well, show us the Father. And Jesus says, what are you asking? I mean, have I been with you so long and you don't know me, Philip? And Philip, in effect, says, hold on, Jesus. You, you, I don't, you didn't, apparently didn't understand my question. I'm, I want to know about that God in the Old Testament that did all those things. Well, here we are. Jesus is going to say, okay, finally, in the last few hours, in fact, few minutes almost, that he has with his disciples, he's going to say, he's going to teach us plainly about the Father. Now, this ought to be one of the most important passages in the entire scripture, right? It says the time will come. Mm -hmm. You got it coming pretty quick. Well, he says, I will speak to you about the Father. He doesn't have much more time to speak about the Father, does he? When that day comes, you will ask him in my name, and I do not say that I will ask him on your behalf. Now, I know pastors who preached on this sermon, sermon on this verse, and they've left out the not. Because they're sure that Jesus is up there pleading with the Father. They're certain of it, right? I do not say they will ask him on your behalf. My dad was a pastor. Mm -hmm. And so I asked him to read that. And so he, he left the knot out. <laughs> I, I said, try, try again, Dad, one more time. And he left the knot out. He continued to leave the knot out. I finally had to say, Dad, you, you, you're leaving out one of the words there. Mm -hmm. and it was just so ingrained did, did that that's it. Did he realize a, that? No. He didn't realize it. He just skipped right he into the he, word. He, he knew what that meant. <laughs> it meant yeah, well, he, he, he knew the verse by memory, probably. He didn't even bother. Look at the words. <laughs> I, didn't, I do not say that I will ask him on your behalf, for the Father himself loves you. He loves you. And I should say there's translators who have translated says, I don't need to ask the Father on your behalf. Well, you know, when we pray, we always say, in Jesus' name. Yes. And so that's not asking Jesus to pray to the Father for us. Mm -hmm. That's just recognizing that Jesus is his son and he was down here with us. And if you go to John 8, it makes it very clear that the Holy Spirit is pleading for us in the same way that Jesus is pleading for us. And there's no difference between the Son and the Spirit and the, and the Father. So how do we understand this? Jesus is here saying, despite all that Old Testament stuff that I gave you, I do not need to plead with the Father on your behalf. Is Jesus saying that the Father is pleading, Jesus is pleading, the Holy Spirit, they're all pleading that we come to their kingdom? Yeah. And Zechariah 3 says that there's only one person on the other side accusing us, and who's that? Satan. 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 Very clearly. The, the devil. Now getting back to Mount Sinai, yeah. where they said that where Moses, they wanted Moses to be in between. Yeah. Moses was saying the same thing, wasn't he? You don't need me mm -hmm. 
to be between you and him. Yep. But they still wanted it that way anyway because there was a problem. Do we, do, we, problem. do we think we need an intercessor in between? Was there an intercessor between Jesus and Judas as he washed Judas' feet in the upper room? No. Was there an intercessor between Jesus and any of the other disciples no. on that occasion? No. Was Jesus God? Do you believe, let's, let's be very blunt here, do you believe that if God the Father came down to earth, he would be willing to wash dirty feet? That's well, what Jesus said. Be consistent. Said. That's what Jesus said. They were, they were, they wanted an intercessor because they were afraid, and also I don't think they wanted that intimate a relationship. You have that intimate a relationship, and it's a two-way, it's a two-way thing. Let me put it in very, very maybe unfair terms. <laughs> Second Peter three, when we ever get there, chapter three is telling us that God's presence melts the elements. He's saying that God, if he re, if he re unleashes his glory, is like an atomic explosion. Would you like to give that a hug? <laughs> We are going to someday. Trust. Yeah. Trust. Yeah. Yeah. You trust enough. So you see, I mean, how do you how do you relate to someone who creates stars and snaps his fingers and creates galaxies and has made all the galaxies in the universe? Well, you know, we today, have a trouble with that. Today we want our pastors uh, to pray for us. We <coughs> want our priests. We got a whole bunch of saints that mm -hmm. uh, we can pray to the saints, and the saints will pray to God. So we're doing the same as the people did with Moses. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, that is shown a lot in Catholicism. Yeah, yeah, and, and in other Christian communions as well, but especially Roman Catholicism. Mm -hmm. I mean, a Mary, of course, is the preeminent person. Um, anyway, we need to get back to our story. Yes. So it's good for us to pray for each other. Yeah. But we do not need an intercessor, because God were to speak directly. Yeah, go ahead. So God. Jesus is saying, Jesus is. You can oh, approach the Holy prayer. Spirit. You can approach Jesus. You can approach the Father without any fear whatsoever. That's what he's saying. He talked. Says, "I'll teach you how to pray." Yeah. Our Father who art in heaven. He talked yeah. directly to the parent. And 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 Paul says, "Call him Daddy." Yeah. Abba. And Abba. that that's the kind of relationship we're designed to have. Mm -hmm. That's the kind of relationship God wants. It's not yeah. some special unique thing uh, that, that's uh, popped up all of a sudden. That, that's just the way it is. Well, Jesus is, is making his way from the upper room to the Garden of Gethsemane. And he has these incredible experiences. In John 17, he gives this prayer, which really we ought to call the Lord's Prayer. The, the, the thing that we memorize is, is his prayer for us. We ought to call this the Lord's Prayer. And who's he praying for? He's praying for his disciples there. He prays for himself. He prays for his disciples, and then he prays for us in that prayer, that awesome prayer in John 17. But then he gets to the Garden of Gethsemane, and what happens there? He says, please stay awake. Well, he says, first of all, to the eight disciples that are left, wait here while I take Peter, James, and John with me into the Garden of Gethsemane. How do you think that the eight felt? Mm. <laughs> now, Peter, James, and John had been with him on some, a number of special occasions, so it wasn't too surprising that they got, uh, you know, singled out. Now, it's possible that James and John were actually cousins of Jesus, so maybe you could understand why they would be a little better. They'd yeah. had those same feelings after the Transfiguration. Yeah. Now we're going into same song, second verse. Yeah. And Jesus goes in there and he starts praying and he's, he's pouring out his heart. I wish we could hear those prayers and really understand what Jesus was saying. We don't, we don't know. We just know he says, Father, if possible, let this cup pass from me. And what did the disciples do? The three who were with him or close by him? Well, they were tired. They went to sleep. Three times, apparently, they went, at least twice, they went to sleep. 
Jesus, Jesus come. in his humanity was trembling. <coughs> mm -hmm. He felt stress. He felt mm -hmm. emotions. Mm -hmm. He was. Go ahead. He was distraught. Yeah, absolutely. I think that their um, the them falling asleep was was just a physical thing, or was there some influence on them? I was I, thinking, what time of night was it? Well, it's hard to tell for sure, but it would clearly be past sundown. It would probably pro we're probably talking ten, eleven, twelve o'clock at night. Do you think after they had had a meal, they were getting uh, some kind of like you want to take a nap after you've had a meal or something? Possibly. They seem too sleepy. That. Well, the whole the devil was doing everything possible to make sure they didn't s figure out what was going on. But this wasn't unique. They had been out here yeah. many times with him, and he had prayed, and and they had gone to sleep, and that's mm -hmm. where they spent the night with Jesus out there. Mm -hmm. Jesus prayed, and they slept. So this so is nothing new. Even though Jesus told them what was going to happen, they did not believe that it was he was going to be killed. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so you think it was just all a physical thing that, that I overcame think, I them? I think that there was the, the uh, devil I, was trying to get them to sleep. There was some help, yeah, a push probably. to make them go. Yeah. 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 Um, I, feel, I feel, I don't want to say wonderful or something, but it gives me encouragement that all these mistakes that the disciples are making over and over and over again, it gives me encouragement, an unworthy person, uh, that God can love us all. Even, you know, Peter denies him three times. They fall asleep in the garden. They're always doing the foolish things. And this encourages me. It means God loves us and he's gentle. He's long-suffering with us. You've answered the question that Gordon's going to ask. What does this say about God? <laughs> well, also that God can use, God can use stumbling, failing people to mm -hmm. accomplish yes. something that's needed. Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, in order to really get a full picture of even what the Bible says about what happened in Gethsemane, you need to read back and forth between the four Gospels, which we don't really have time for right now. Uh, to get a, a feel for it, perhaps, I'd like to read a little bit from Luke and a little bit from Mark. Uh, let's start with Luke. It's chapter 22, starting with verse 39. Jesus left the city and went as he usually did. Notice, as he usually did to the Mount of Olives. Mm -hmm. This was a favorite place for him to retreat to. And the disciples went with him. When he arrived at the place, he said to them, Pray that you will not fall into temptation. Now, it's interesting, he doesn't say, pray that you won't fall asleep. He said, pray that you won't fall into temptation. Then he went off from them about the distance of a stone's throw and knelt down and prayed. Father, he said, if you will, not, if you will take this cup of suffering away from me. Not my will, however, but your will be done. And an angel from heaven appeared to him and strengthened him. What was happening there? An angel from heaven appeared to him and strengthened him. Look at um, look at John 18, verse 6. There's a very interesting parallel, and we're just about to time to take a break. John 18, verse 6. Je when Jesus said to them, I am he, he's talking about the people who had come to arrest him, they moved back and fell to the ground. Again, Jesus asked them, who is it you're looking for? Now, my question for you to think about before we come back is, the angel, did he have anything to do with their falling back onto the ground? We'll be right back.
Welcome back. We're so glad you decided to stay by. Ellen White, in her book Desire of Ages, speaks in detail about what happened in the Garden of Gethsemane and later what happened on Calvary. And she says that Jesus actually fell dying to the ground there and had to be revived by an angel. Why would Jesus be dying after just a few hours of prayer? Maybe well, not even hours. He was sweating blood. He was sweating so blood, okay. As a physician, what does it take for a person to sweat blood? Pretty horrendous. It takes, it takes such a, a so massive stress that your vascular system starts to break down. Mm. So, so he's dying by of stress? Would you massive, like to speak about that as a pathologist? Stress? Uh, I've never seen it. No. But it is it documented. Has it has happened. It has happened. It has happened. Yeah. To other people, not mm -hmm. just Jesus. So that's answering your question. It was just stress. Well, we're saying that, but, but it wasn't, that wasn't the only thing that happened. And, and let's think about it for a moment. Who was watching what happened there in Gethsemane? The unlucky universe. Were the angels, I mean, were the disciples watching? Nope. They were asleep. They didn't see it. The only ones, this was a demonstration for the benefit of the universe. The angels and the rest of the beings in the universe. And what did they see? The Father was not laying a hand or a finger on his Had side. Jesus had a crown of thorns yet, no. so far? Had he been beaten? No. Had he been crucified? None of those things. He goes out there, he kneels down to pray, and he dies. What, what, what does that say to us? What, it, what killed him? Uh, just stress. Isn't there a syndrome scared to death? Absolutely. Uh, yeah. In which you're so stressed by what you see that it kills you. There's Jesus was a, he was a very, he was not sinful. Did Jesus for the first time see and feel sin? Yes. And what does that mean? He was taken our sin on him. Mm. Well, and, and there's two ways to look at that. He was taking our sin upon himself. He was dealing with, Romans 8, 3 says, he came to deal with sin, concerning sin, is what it says literally in the Greek. He came concerning sin. Isaiah 59, 2 says, our sins, God speaking to us, your sins have separated you from me. Now, if Jesus as a human being lives the kind of the same kind of life we do, if he takes upon himself sin, what does that mean? It means he's allowing himself to be separated from the Father, right? Well, that is it. causing him great, great anxiety because he has never been separated from yep. the Father in throughout all eternity. Yeah. Desire of Ages 685, paragraph 2. So dreadful does sin appear to him so great is the weight of guilt which he must bear that he is tempted to fear it will shut him out forever from his father's love. Feeling how terrible is the wrath of God against transgression, he exclaims, my soul is exceedingly sorrowful even unto death. How is that possible that he is able to assume the consequences of my sin at that? my sins separate me from from God that's a consequence of my sin so how is he able to to take that separation and and of course we're we're looking not only at 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 uh, getting kind of theological pretty deep here but <laughs> but um you know I, I've got my set of sins mm -hmm. but then there seems to be something plaguing me simply because I'm a human being mm -hmm. um and somewhere along the line, maybe we'll figure out what that means. But, you know, it seemed like Adam did something. I wasn't there. I didn't have anything to do with it. So how come I'm struggling with wool, you know, and so on? Well, so how, how is it that, that whatever all of that is, Jesus is able to step in and say, okay, I'm going to take whatever all that is. Whatever all that is, um, how does that work? Okay. Let, let's, let's try to say it in the simplest terms. Now, we could go on in theological jargon for a long time, 
But let me put it in very blunt terms. None of us were born in the Garden of Eden. None of us has tasted from the Tree of Life. We can't, if we're separated from God and we, we don't have access to the Tree of Life, we're dead. If God were not keeping us alive moment by moment, we would just die. We would stop breathing, our heart would stop beating everything. Ellen White has a very picturesque way of putting that. She says, every heartbeat is a rebound from the touch of the finger of God. So, you think that changes in heaven? No. No. I mean, that's humanity. That's the yeah. way humanity is designed to operate. Yeah. Well, not, all, not only humanity, but frogs and squirrels and Absolutely. all the other beings and even angels. So yeah. everything, that's, the, that's just the way God's relationship is to all. Everything he's created. It's all dependent on him. Yeah. Yeah. So apparently what happens in light of, now if I can bring some of words from Jesus' words from, from, from Calvary back to Gethsemane, the explanation of why Jesus dies in Gethsemane appears to be the Father says, watch what happens. He says to the universe, because we're not watching. It's not for us. The universe is watching. He says, watch what happens if I remove my life-giving power, if I remove my love, my care from this human being who's, by the way, my divine son, but right now his, his, his divinity is set aside. Watch what happens. Now, in my case, I separate myself. Mm -hmm. That's not the case in Jesus. He didn't. He hasn't separated himself. At least he's spiritual or he's godly. But so. they, see, they agreed to put on this demonstration. And, that, and I want to be really careful. We're not, this is not some kind of a show. God says, you need to understand how deadly sin is. I'm not asking any of you to demonstrate how, sinly, how deadly sin is. Because if you die sin and I don't step in, no you're, you're finished. You're finished permanently. So he was made to be sin even though he was not a sinner. Yeah, 2 Corinthians 5. Mm -hmm. Which a is a lot of collateral damage in sin. Yeah. It isn't just with one individual, others are affected. Which is, a, which is a miracle in itself and probably maybe even something we can't understand. We just have to, we just have to understand it as best we can and take a lot of it. Yeah, but we're seeing it. We're seeing a sacrifice here for a demonstration. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So something that has to, something that's so important to be taught here that Jesus was willing to die to teach it. Well, the, the Bible sacrifice. Yeah. That when you, you were asking what mm -hmm. the sacrifice was, this is it. There you go. You know, you. And I don't want to trivialize anything here, but um, there's a story told, and this is kid stuff, of course the the uh, chicken talking to the pig and uh, they're, they're saying it's time for breakfast they want to have bacon and eggs and the pig the pig says to the chicken says well for you that's a sacrifice but for me it's a total commitment <laughs> <laughs> so in, in, in a sense you, you think about this Jesus isn't just giving something or paying a price it's a total commitment it's a completely... But yet it is a paying a price in a way because yeah. somebody has to do that. He has to do it. He's the only one that can do it. And we need to talk about now, he goes out and we could spend a long time discussing about the fact that he's arrested. Uh, and I firmly believe that that angel, uh, and of course that's based on my reading of Desire of Ages, that angel who revived Jesus sort of waved back those arresters and they fell to the ground like dead men. And what should they have recognized at that point in time? Ken, can I go back just one minute? Yeah. yeah. If Jesus had died in the Garden of Gethsemane mm -hmm. without any humans seeing him, would that have been enough? Well, that would have been enough for the universe. They saw what Satan was doing. They saw what God was doing. They saw the, how the effects of sin actually killed Jesus. But we would have woken up maybe the next morning, come over there, oh, he died, what happened? He maybe had a heart attack. Maybe he died of a stroke. Maybe the blood pressure got too high or something like that. We would not have a clue of, of what was the cause of his death. Well, not only that, but we would never have seen just what, what Satan 
w wants to do. Yeah. Now, is Jesus or what we would all do? Is Jesus the only one that could have done that? God yes. Himself is the only one because He had the power to raise Himself afterwards. But that's that's only the the the, the last part of the story, because. The questions from day one of the great controversy are not about you, they're not about me, they're not about some angel. The questions are about God. What kind of a person is he? Is he willing to go through any kind of personal self-sacrifice as he asks us to do? And, and another thing, and the though, devil had always said, no, God isn't willing to do that. You know, it asks him, though, it, people ask, you know, how far do I go before I really get God mad at me? Mm -hmm. You know, well, look at the cross. See what mm -hmm. they were doing to him. They were spitting at him. They were they were beating him. They were putting the crowns on him, and he was still yeah. positive Father, towards forgive us. them. You yeah, don't know what they're doing. all the way. So that answers that question. If yeah. he hadn't done that, that question wouldn't have been answered. Yeah. In, in a sense, there is a little bit about us because what we see was. If we, if we are filled with sin, we will even seek to kill God. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So what we have here now is the, the world's foremost religionists. I can use that term advisedly. These people absolutely believed that they were doing God's will. These are the people in the Garden of Gethsemane. They were arresting Jesus, and they were taking him out, and they went through all those trials, and finally... You know, after he'd been through all that, they put the cross on him and made him try to carry it. He couldn't carry it up that steep hill to, to Golgotha, which was the name at that time. Later, we call it Calvary. Calvary is Latin. Golgotha is, is from the Hebrew, the Aramaic. But finally, he had to get somebody else to carry it for him, and they crucified him. And as they're crucifying him, before they put the cross up, what did he say? Father, forgive them. Father, forgive them. They we don't know, know what they're doing. Now, do you think Jesus would have to forgive them before he could ask his father to forgive them? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Yeah. So what does that tell us about, oh, by the way, were they asking for forgiveness? Oh. No. No. But God is yeah, forgiveness I personified. Guess. That's the way God is. Mm -hmm. Remember the, the story was, well, how many times should I forgive somebody? Mm -hmm. Seven times? No. Seventy times seven. And it isn't to get out there and start counting up to 490. No, you always forgive. Yeah. Yeah. So God is forgiveness even, he's forgiving even the people who don't ask for it, haven't asked for it, had no thought of asking for it as they're pounding the nails through his hands. And were those that were forgiven, were they safe to save or were they no. good? No, the, the problem so, of evil is it's a disease and you need to be healed from it. Okay, and so what we have learned from this experience is you need more than forgiveness to be safe to save. Now, many of our Christian friends believe that forgiveness is the key to justification, and that's the only requirement for salvation. If so, then those people who are pounding the nails through Jesus' hands and feet were safe to save. We need to become good people so that we don't pound nails in people's yeah. hands. Yeah, of course. That's part of it. So then they, they hang him up there, and what happens next? He's speaking with the two. <laughs> what? He has a conversation with the two thieves and whatnot. Okay, that's, that's, mm -hmm. that happens. And what, what happened in that conversation? <laughs> one believed and one didn't. Okay. A microcosm. Mm -hmm. once, once again, if we can turn to Ellen White, it turns out that the one who said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom, had actually been a follower of Jesus for a while. And then he thought, you know, our religious leaders couldn't all be wrong. And so he turned away from Jesus. He said, this, this Jesus can't be right, and all these people be wrong. So he turned away from Jesus, fell into bad ways, got into bad company, and ended up being a thief and getting himself crucified. But when he saw him, he said, and he looked and he saw what they were doing, he saw what Jesus was doing, and he said, no, I was wrong. Jesus is, is the Messiah. And he says, and if you come into your kingdom, I, I believe you will. If you come into your kingdom, let me be there. And Jesus said, absolutely, you will be. Question. Mm -hmm. um, much is made about the word today. Mm -hmm. 
and because of that many people believe about the soul separation and what have you but we know that's not so okay let's let's be honest about that that verse in the in the Greek it says literally as it does in the King James I say unto you today you will be with me in paradise and there is no punctuation in the Greek so you have to decide whether it come, it comes before the today or whether it comes after the today and in light of the rest of scripture there's no question in my mind but the fact that that comma goes after the today I say unto you today you will be with me in paradise for the proof of that, what did Jesus say to Mary in John 20? I haven't been. I have father. not yet ascended to my Father. Now the Catholic Church has a way of getting around that. They say Jesus went to a place called Paradise. No, there's no biblical evidence for that whatsoever. That he, where he was preaching to the souls in prison. Da da da. da uh, First Peter 3:19 and 20 over there, but. Uh, um, God, Jesus said, paradise is heaven, and I haven't been there yet on, on, on Resurrection Sunday. I read a bit in the Maccabees. I think I read something similar, but I didn't. I don't fully understand it, so I don't want to yeah. say much. Well, Maccabees is, is one of the places that the Catholic Church takes. To, mm -hmm. says it's, it's a holy and wholesome mm -hmm. thing to pray for the dead and so yeah. forth like this. And they fit that in with this and say that Jesus was over there and he was you know, taking care of all those dead people or the spirits of the dead people and so forth. And there's a lot of interesting theology. I would be happy to deal with that. I actually wrote a part of my master's uh, thesis in, in, in my, when I got my degree in religion about those verses and, and how they should be interpreted. But we're not, we don't have time to go there right now. So, so what happened fairly soon after they were crucified a great darkness fell on over the place. How long did the darkness last? Three hours. About three hours. How dark was it? Very dark. You couldn't see your hand in front of you your face. You could not see even any trace of your hand in front of your face. It was really, really dark. That means not even any starlight. And right. And this, what time of the day was this? Yeah. In the middle of the day. Was it three o'clock to six o'clock? Or no, this was this was nine to twelve. Nine to twelve. Yeah. Also, it, and it couldn't be an eclipse, right? Because eclipse lasts be, about, you know. Well, on top of that, you've got the Passover. Where yeah. The moon is going to be full. full. Exactly. Right. It's going to be on the other side of the earth. Right. Was it during the darkness that the Roman soldier said out loud, "This truly must be the Son of"? That happens right after he dies. <clears throat> so it's a, it's before. It's still a little ways coming. So in so let's so this perfectly dark for and then it starts to lighten up a little bit. And apparently there was like a, a, a beam of light or something came down over Jesus. And we have those final words. And what does Jesus say in those final words? My God, Remember? my God, why have you forsaken me? And why would he say that? Why have you let me go? Not now, why are you beating me up? Yeah, well, let's, let's <laughs> think about this for a moment. What do people believe? If Jesus is dying the death of the wicked... And he, he, he's, he's paying our price, so he's dying the death of the wicked. What, let's, let's think about our Christian friends now in the broader context here. What is their belief about what happens to the wicked? They go to hell. And? Burn. burn for how long? Burn. Forever. So Jesus must be somewhere still burning forever, right? No, we're missing the fire here. We're missing the fire? Yeah. How could Jesus die the death of the wicked if? No fire. There's does no fire. The, does the Bible say that he dies the death of the wicked, or is that our No, that, view? See, the Bible implies that in several places. Ellen White certainly says that. And, and our Christian friends absolutely believe that. Yeah. 1 Corinthians 15, uh, some other places in Paul, he talks about Jesus dying the death of the wicked. So if he died the death of the wicked, he died, God killed him, and then sent him to hell? It was a sentence. Well, what about that? I mean, what is going on? Jesus didn't say, my God, my God, why are you killing me? God didn't kill him. Why are you burning me up? Why are you torturing me forever? I mean, three days later, he's, he's rising from the grave. So how could this be the death of the wicked? Well, in Genesis 
Satan, well, God said, if you eat of the fruit, you will die. Mm -hmm. You will become sinful, you will die. Satan says, you won't die. And is Jesus dying the death? It can't be the death of the wicked as usually thought of. No. Because so otherwise Jesus would have to still be burning. He, we, we'd have to have some fire someplace and we don't yeah. have that. But so now we've got to revise what we think course, the death of the wicked unless is. Unless of course you think the, the, the wicked are all going to be crucified. Oh. <laughs> I don't think anybody's talking about that. <laughs> <laughs> so okay. now we've got to revamp what we think the, the, the death of the wicked is. Well there's a clue to that. It's found in the last verse in the book of Isaiah. Look, look at Isaiah 66, verse 24. Now, we, we read up through verse 24. We love Isaiah 65 and 66 and all about what's going to happen in heaven. And we read, just as the new earth and the new heavens will endure by my power, so your descendants and your name will endure on every new moon festival, every Sabbath. People of every nation will come to worship me here in Jerusalem, says the Lord. And then we want to make sure that everybody stops. We don't want to read beyond. We don't want to read verse 24. 24 first. Verse 24 says, as they leave, these would be the people apparently coming for the new moon festival and the Sabbath festival. As they leave, they will see the dead body, the corpses some versions have, of those who have rebelled against me. The worms that eat them will never die, and the fire that burns them will never be put out. The sight of them will be disgusting to all people. What is being burned here in, 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 the, in hell according to this verse? dead bodies. Dead bodies. Are they suffering torture? Not if they're dead. So they weren't live bodies thrown in there? They were dead bodies thrown in there? Dead bodies thrown in there. Jesus died of sin. He died what we call the second death. The wicked at the end will die the second death, the final and eternal irrevocable death that comes as a direct result of sin. Now, what happens after that is a different question. Jesus, because he was God and because he was not a sinner, was able to rise by his own power and go back to heaven. The wicked have no such power. When they die of the second death, the fire, and Ellen White describes that fire as the cleansing flames, the cleansing flames, those flames will clean up this earth, get rid of all traces of sin, all traces of death, all traces of of disease, all traces of anything evil of any kind, and God will remake this earth like the Garden of Eden. So if I'm evil, I'm going to die twice. Well, it's likely I will die twice. I will yeah. die what we would say is a normal death of most human beings, unless somebody shoots me or something mm -hmm. like that. And then that's there will come. The first death. Then there will. Yeah, that's right. And then that's known as the first death. And then there was going to come a time when the judgment is all said and done. And if I'm wicked, then that will be the, the final time that I will no longer Some, be alive. You may, have, you may have seen the bumper stick where it says, born once, die twice. Born twice, die once. And what, what, are, they, what are they talking about there? Well, it's got a mathematical me. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> One again in Christ. God is always depicted as fire. Mm -hmm. So when God, the sinners, they, they want to hold on to their sin. And when God presents himself fully, he doesn't hide himself anymore, he presents himself fully. Anybody who's holding on to their sin gets immediately incinerated. The Deuteronomy, the bodies then. Deuteronomy 4, yeah. Romans 13, I'm, not, I'm sorry, uh, um, Hebrews 13 says, or Hebrews 12, 29, our God is a consuming fire. Mm -hmm. And he's a purifying fire. So yeah. if you don't have peace of Jesus in you, <coughs> helping purify. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But where do you separate the bodies and the death? In answer there. to the question, the physical death and uh, being born again. Mm -hmm. That's what that means. Yeah, yeah exactly, mm -hmm. exactly. So, in conclusion, let's see if we can draw a few, a few conclusions from all of this. Jesus really died. There's no question. But they put that sword in his side. He was already dead. Okay? Was it, as Satan has claimed, he, Satan has claimed that everyone who dies, it's because God is angry at, at us for, for choosing Satan's side, and so he kills people. 
Is there any evidence that God killed Jesus? No. But what did Jesus say? Why have you forsaken me? And what happens? What happens when you believe? Well, maybe you're afraid of God. Maybe you, you, you're not too sure about him and so forth. And you're scared to death. But you want to do your utmost that you possibly can to obey him with 600 and how many laws to keep the Sabbath, etc. Like the Jewish leaders. You could find yourself out there with the Jewish leaders crucifying God in God's name. Think about the implications of that. So we learn a lot of things from the death of Christ. It's not God who is the one killing. Jesus died to teach us exactly the implication. Well, the, the final results of sin, Romans 6.23, it's right there. Paul says it so many, in so many words. So Jesus, by his life and his death, give us a choice. We can choose to live the kind of life which he lived, or we will die the kind of death which he died. And there it is. So that was the demonstration. His life, his death. Romans 1 talks about the fact that God hands over the wicked. That's his wrath. Romans 4.25 says that Jesus on Calvary was handed over. It doesn't say handed over to die, although most translations will include those words to die. Jesus was handed over. And what did Jesus say? My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? So God's wrath, if we can, if we, if we can use these terms, God's wrath is simply his turning away in loving disappointment from those who don't want him anyway, thus leaving them to the inevitable and awful consequences, awful, awful consequences of their own rebellious choices. So there you have it, folks. You can choose to be a Christian. You can choose to live as Jesus lived. You can struggle to find out why Jesus had to die. You can do your best to learn about him and follow his example, as he suggested in John 16, John 15 and 16, or someday you will die that awful, terrible, unthinkable death which he died on the cross. The choice is yours. See you next week.